Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for the We Choose Health webinar about Action for Healthy Kids tools and resources. Uh, we are really excited to have you all with us uh, during the first week of this kind of busy end of year season and um, are looking forward to chatting with you a little bit today. Get my screen going there. So we have two presenters today. My name is Hannah Laughlin. I am the Regional Field Manager for the Midwest and the Northwest for Action for Healthy Kids. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit in the beginning about some of the federal regulation that is around school wellness and kind of why it's important from a national level. Then I'm going to turn it over to Heidi Knobloch, who is our Illinois State Coordinator for Action for Healthy Kids. She's going to get into some more nitty-gritty details about how you can really take this information and make it tangible uh, to you in your community um, with your uh, funded uh, schools or districts that you're working with. So let's review some logistics before we get started. Once you are linked into the, the GoToWebinar technology, which is what we're using today, you'll see a control panel that's usually on the right side of your screen. You can uh, dial in either by telephone or by speaker, but you should know that everyone is muted on the call today to avoid static and background noise. There is a dialog box, however, at the bottom of that control panel that allows you to type in questions as we're going along, and then we'll get to them later at the end of the presentation. Uh, so please, as you have questions, feel free to enter them. Heidi and I will monitor them and then talk through them at the end of the call, and we're happy to be resources to you after the call as well. In addition, the call is being recorded today, so we will send you the link. Uh, via the We Choose Health Coordinated School Health uh, listserv and, and Tracy after the presentation today. So sit back and really uh, listen to the information that, that we're telling you and don't feel like you have to take a lot of notes because you will um, get the recording later. So let's get started. I'd like to first give you a little bit of background information about Action for Healthy Kids. Action for Healthy Kids is a national nonprofit that fights childhood obesity, undernourishment, and physical inactivity by helping schools become healthier places. We're a network of about 60,000 moms, dads, teachers, students, school and community leaders, as well as school wellness experts that have banded together to create healthy learning environments for children. We believe that everyone, uh, no, regardless of your role in your community, has a part to play in ending the nation's childhood obesity ec epidemic, and we have programs, tools, and resources that make that possible. And we feel really fortunate today to be um, talking to the group of uh, We Choose Health grantees and, and kind of community partners out there, because we know that you're great resources for our um, schools across the state of Illinois as they work towards this mission of becoming healthier places. Uh, Action for Healthy Kids was founded in 2002 by former Surgeon General David Thatcher. And like I said, today we have more than 60,000 members across the country that are working on our goal, which you see on the screen here, which is really to create school communities where children learn how to make healthy choices from the minute they walk in the front door of the school to the minute they leave at the end of the day. So whether they're leaving at a normal dismissal time or after an after-school activity, we really want to make sure that uh, children are getting that healthy message consistently across the school day. We also have a partner of about a, a partner network here at Action for Healthy Kids of about 75 organizations at a national level, from professional organizations to government agencies and corporations that really help support the work that we do and are banding together. We just hosted a conference um, a few weeks ago in Washington, Washington, D.C., really working to band together so that we have a bigger collective impact on the field of school wellness. And Action for Healthy Kids really follows a three-step model that we call Learn, Act, Transform. So first, we think it's really important that people learn about the issues and the solutions uh, to the problems, and, and we really want to empower people across the country as well as here locally in Illinois uh, about the steps that they can take to work towards fighting childhood obesity. 
that's the reason that you're here today. Um, it's the reason that we're here today. And we really hope that today you can learn more about how our tools and resources can support the work that you're doing through your We Choose Health grant. Um, and, and that you will really learn and feel uh, empowered to take this information back to your schools. Second, like I just said, it's really important that people not only learn how to uh, learn about the issue, but also go out there and act. So act for healthy kids in your school and your community, and really make sure that you're, you're making uh, changes that ultimately can lead to the third step um, of our, of our three-step model, which is transform. So transform your school culture to make it a sustainable, lasting change instead of something that is just happening right now because you have We Choose Health funding, and find a way for it really to become part of your school's culture that you focus on health. So Action for Healthy Kids does a lot of things, but um, as you can see, we, we have a big network and we have this big model that we use nationally, but why are we really talking to this group today? So actually, our national headquarters is actually located here in Chicago, and Heidi and I are both um, based out of our national office and work very strategically with partners across the state of Illinois to improve school wellness in our Illinois-based schools um, and help Illini kids to really be healthier. So we thought we would start by helping you understand a little bit more really why school wellness is even a priority across the country and also here in Illinois. In 2010, the USDA updated the Women, Infant, and Child Act um, that was originally passed in 2004. They updated that with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. And this federal regulation stipulated that all schools that participate in the National School Lunch Program or other child nutrition programs have to establish a school district wellness policy. Um, I know the word policy is often kind of scary to people and, and turns people off. And since as we choose health grantees, you're not actually school building employees, it becomes even more intimidating. But we really wanted to make sure that you understood what the Healthy Hunger for Kids Act does and how you can help your schools become healthier places through wellness policies. So the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act outlines a number of different things related to the school lunch program and the school breakfast program, uh, reimbursable meals, and, and a lot of things. But when it talks about district wellness policies, it talks about some minimum standards that district wellness policies must address. And these are listed on the screen here. The first of which is your district wellness policy has to have goals at a minimum around nutrition promotion and education, physical activity, and school-based wellness activities. We're going to talk about this a little bit more and what that really means and what you could put in your policy in a few slides, but know that it does really have some tangible requirements around healthy eating and physical activity. In addition, like I said before, it does have nutrition guidelines for all foods sold in schools. So that includes the National School Lunch Program, the National School Breakfast Program, and then also competitive foods. We're waiting on a new regulation from USDA right now that will further define um, kind of those competitive foods, which means any food sold outside of the school cafeteria. Um, they're working on some new health regulations around those things, so that's um, vending machines, school stores, um, school events, and whatnot, but the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act begins to set up the framework for those competitive foods, but really mainly addresses those cafeteria-based foods. The third requirement, uh, minimum requirement for those district wellness policies is that they permit and encourage a diverse group of stakeholders to participate in the development, implementation, review, and updating of that policy. In general, that means that they are looking for um, a diverse group of stakeholders that may include um, PE teachers, school health professionals, parents, students, uh, food service representatives, school board members, school administrators, including maybe the superintendent or um, someone from the district level, as well as building level administrators, and then also the public and community staff community partners and stakeholders. So really encouraging and permitting this group of individuals to really look at how health and wellness is affecting students across the district 
and, and giving input and really having their voices heard around the policy. This particular bullet, bullet number three, is a new addition to the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act um, and is building upon and strengthening these wellness policy requirements. So we're really excited at Action for Healthy Kids that the government is working to encourage uh, stakeholders across the kind of continuum of people who may be interested in school health and wellness, that they are encouraging uh, kind of a diversity in that group because we really think that it helps to build the culture of health and wellness in the schools. Bullet number four is that you have to inform and update the public about the content and implementation of the local wellness policies. Also a new requirement under the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Um, in the old uh, WIC Authorization Act of 2004, districts were required to have wellness policies and many states, including Illinois, uh, gave out model wellness policies that a lot of districts across the state implemented. But, uh, 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 adopted at the district level, but really there was no implementation of those policies because the districts weren't held accountable for that. So the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act really requires more engagement of the community around the wellness policy so that really school districts and school buildings are accountable for what the policy says and are really working towards making the changes that are required. And that last bullet is that just School districts are required to measure and publicize the school wellness policies periodically on the extent of school compliance, comparison to model policies, and the progress made in attaining policy goals. So again, just engaging the public to make sure that schools actually are following the policy and it's not just a binder on a shelf somewhere uh, that's never being addressed. I know if you are like me, federal regula regulation can be a little bit overwhelming and even when boiled down to five bullet points, uh, can, can be overwhelming to, to people to process. So Action for Healthy Kids has worked with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, um, to develop our National Wellness Policy Tool. And this is a tool that is intended to help have anyone involved in developing, implementing, and evaluating wellness policies by providing practical guidance and how-to information about the wellness policy process. So in essence, that, that kind of big wordy sentence is really just saying that our wellness policy tool was developed to help people exactly like you who are not experts in school health and wellness necessarily, um, and even those who are experts kind of work through that federal regulation and understand what is required and what isn't required and the steps that can be taken to strengthen and improve the wellness policy around the 2010 Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Our wellness policy is made up of seven steps. Uh, and I'm going to actually navigate now to our website and kind of walk you through our wellness policy tool and how it works so that you can understand kind of what each step means and what it could mean to you in your district. What I would recommend that you do is talk to your school districts about their policy. Ask them when it was last updated, who's in charge of it, and see where you can kind of get in on this process and understand the, where the districts that you're working with are in this kind of continuum of steps one through seven. Let me get to our Action for Healthy Kids website. If you go to www.actionforhealthykids.org, you will navigate to the Tools for Schools tab, and then to the Wellness Policy tool right here on the right-hand column. You have to log in. Um, you do have to create an account. It's free to access, but we do like to track who is accessing it. Um, not who specifically, but the, but the number of who, who are utilizing the resource. Because we like to report back to the CDC that schools really are trying to implement and, and care about uh, this process. So once you log in, you'll be taken to this kind of home page for, for the wellness policy tool, which explains to you what the tool is and, and why it's seven steps and kind of the general information about the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, like we just reviewed. You'll want to just go ahead over to this graphic and click on the step that you want to see. So we'll click on step number one, which is build a wellness team. This is uh, an interesting thing, and Heidi's going to talk about it a little bit more, but what we're talking about when we say build a strong team here 
is build a district level wellness team, a group of people who are accountable for what is in the policy, that the po policy is in existence and is being maintained and is also being implemented. So as I mentioned before, the federal regulation does require that parents and administrators are contributing to the development process. So building a wellness team should really engage a diverse group of stakeholders. And as you'll see, there's information about that here as well as some questions that you should consider um, as you build that wellness team at the district level or if you already have a wellness team. Some questions to touch base with again just to see if you're kind of in alignment with what the federal regulation requires. Step number two is assess your environment. And I know through the We Choose Health grant, each one of you have done the school health index, whether you've done it at a district level or a school uh, building level or a couple of schools or whatever level you have done it, you really have used the school health index to assess your um, health and safety policies and programs in your building. So you've already done a pretty good job of looking at this step, but the question is, how have you um, worked with your wellness team that you created in step one to really reinforce what you learned in your assessment um, so that you can determine what aspects of your district's current policies and practices around nutrition, physical activity, and nutrition education are working and what needs to be improved upon. This is a really important step and one I think that you guys are really kind of ahead of the game on because you have that school health assessment already completed, um, but one that you want to make sure you're integrating with step number one, um, that you're talking about it with your whole school health team and not just your We Choose Health team. Step number three is draft the policy and procedures. So creating policy documents is often very scary, um, and, and if you aren't familiar with it, kind of a process that can be overwhelming. You want to make sure that your policy spells out exactly what you're trying to accomplish regarding district wellness policy or wellness practices. So really, we encourage schools to avoid vo uh, vague language in writing the wellness policy. As you'll see here, we encourage words that are, include must or require instead of recommend or encourage because as you get into the implementation steps later in the policy, words that are more vague like this don't require schools to do anything. It's encouraging, um, but what you really want is to require schools to make health and wellness a priority because the research shows that it helps students academically. So really working um, on including strong language is important. Also, the policy should be written with very specific guidance towards implementation strategies. So that as you do have to report it out to the public and, and measure and evaluate the results, you can refer to your policy and understand exactly what it is you're looking to measure. So make sure you do look at that. A little farther down the page here, it does give some examples. We have to remember that policy is affected at different levels. Federal, state, and local policy does affect it. So you want to make sure you're following that. And then there's more information here about the minimum goals of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. So do take a look at that. We do have specific questions that each uh, school wellness team member might be interested in understanding or engaging with. So it's a wonderful resource as well. And then further questions for consideration as you do um, draft a, uh, a version of that policy that before it goes to the board. Further down on each page, we do have resources for every single um, component on things that you can do. And one that I really like and wanted to point out to each of you is the NASB Online State School Health Policy Database. So if you click on this link here, you'll be navigated to this page here, which shows a map of the United States, and we can click on Illinois. This is really a database that outlines all of the policies at a state level that will affect health and wellness. So I think it's a really good one for Illinois, so you can familiarize yourself with what the state requirements are. So you can look at those kind of minimum requirements that we talked about earlier, those five bullets about the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act requirements. Then look at this NASB database so you can understand state level policy and requirements. And then finally, look at your district and, and understand what you would like to put in your policy that aligns with those two things. So there's information here about health education, physical education, um, RPE mandate, 
some uh, more health-related things about asthma and mental health and sexual health, uh, nutrition education, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and drug use, injury and violence prevention, staff wellness, which is a good one to look at as well. And then down at the bottom, more information about health-promoting environments. So here is the Illinois version of the requirement for the uh, school wellness policy. You're going to see here that this has not been updated for the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. The dates here are 2007 and 2005, as well as this local wellness policy toolkit, which was developed in 2005 by Illinois. Action for Healthy Kids with our um, wellness policy tool is one of the first organizations across the country to offer guidance to schools on the new Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act requirements. A lot of the state level and other national level resources are outdated because of, of the switch to that new federal regulation. So I wanted to point you to this so you see um, what, what is available here, but I do want to caution you to be careful about looking at those dates and make sure that anything that you're looking at is, is past 2010. Um, when it comes to wellness policy requirements because the information here is outdated. Also information here about school meals and competitive foods in schools. So it is a great resource for you to look at as you're trying to understand kind of what policies are necessary uh, for your districts that you're working with. Step number four of our wellness policy tool is about adopting the policy and really making sure that you have taken the time that is necessary to educate your school board and your school district administration on those requirements of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act and why it's important to update the policy. Um, have reviewed that draft policy with them so they understand exactly which components you're encouraging and putting in there. And then really making sure they understand the connection between healthy students and academic performance. You have to um, spend a lot of time, and I'm sure you guys are all experienced seeing this now, uh, educating district and school administration on why healthy school environments are important in this uh, academic culture that we're in, the school culture that's really based around testing and reading and math. A lot of times superintendents and principals don't understand the importance of of healthy schools. And if you can really talk to them about healthy students are in school more, they have better attendance, they learn better, they score higher on academic tests, they, and they leave your school district with more potential for as adults, it's really a good way to try to convince them that your policy and the work that you're doing should be a priority in your district. Step number five is implementing the policy. As I've said a couple times before, Adopting the policy is step one, but there's not always procedures in place to guarantee that policies are enforced. So really working on educating, once you pass that policy with your board and your administration, educating principals and teachers and PE teachers and any group that you can talk to about the policy so that people really understand why it's important and why you have it in your district and what it says so that schools are in full compliance. Step number six is to evaluate and sustain the policy. As I've said a couple of times again, um, you want to have a standardized review process so you can benchmark kind of your goals around your policy and, and make sure that they make sense. And as you do that evaluation, make sure you're communicating the results. It is part of the federal requirement that school districts inform and update the public about the comp content and implementation of wellness policies. And it's such a good story to tell from a communication standpoint. School districts are often getting you know, slammed in the media for um, you know, teacher contracts and uh, you know, budget deficits or you know, all kinds of negative things. And wellness stories are really great ways to talk about things that are um, encouraging and positive in your district. So if you can get some positive media time out of it um, and also meet your federal requirement of communicating the results, it's really a win-win for everyone. So like I said before, I know that is a lot of information to go over all at once about policy if you're not a policy expert. Um, which I am not, and I assume that none of you are either. Um, but really, what next steps can you take? And I've kind of already said a couple of them, but the first thing you should do is, with the district you're working with, look for your district wellness policy. Talk to the people that you have contact with in those districts and see 
When was it last updated? What is the status of, of it? And if it hasn't been updated since 2010 or really 2011, work with your districts to make sure that it is in compliance with that federal regulation. And you guys have a really great head start, like I said, because you've already done your school health index. So you already have that assessment that you can really integrate into your policy. One thing we see a lot from school districts is their policy might be a little bit weak, but their practices might actually be strong. So they might require every school to host recess, but it's not written in their policy because it's just something that's always been done in that school district. And really just writing that into your policy um, it is a good way to strengthen that policy and something I feel like you guys probably know a lot of those cultural strengths from your districts already because of the school health index that you've done. There's also some um, key things that you can consider when you develop your local wellness policy. We have a great document that I'm going to share with you in the follow-up email that has some kind of key considerations that you should, should think about. So as we said, the, goal, the requirements of that federal regulation are nutrition education, physical activity, and food sold in school. So make sure your, your policy is addressing all four of those first, uh, these first four bullets here. Um, but also those new requirements about uh, measurement and evaluation and um, how you're doing that. Then add some additional things about kind of general school wellness initiatives. Maybe you have a policy about marketing foods and beverages, or you have a farm to school policy about sustainable food practices, um, and, or you have a program of those things. Maybe you can write that into your policy so that it's more sustainable in the long term. Maybe you have a joint use agreement with a local community organization. Make sure that's in your wellness policy that, so that people know that. Maybe you use the coordinated school health approach or the catch approach. Write that into your wellness policy so that people in the public understand that. In addition, you might work um, on staff wellness in your area. I know that worksite wellness is a focus of the We Choose Health grant and something that really can be incorporated into your wellness policy so that staff in your district understand the district's commitment to their health as well and the importance that it plays in, in overall school wellness and also uh, student health as role models. So incorporating these components are all really good places to start and think about. And as I said, I'm going to send you a document that gives you more information on steps that you can take. But if you're like me, you uh, probably are a little tired of just talking about policy. I know you guys have kind of started to dive into the world of school wellness and understand it a little bit. But I think really talking about how we can take the things that we just talked about and turn them into more tangible steps that you can actually utilize in your community is really important. So I'm going to turn it over now to Heidi, um, who I introduced earlier as our Illinois Action for Healthy Kids State Coordinator, who's going to walk you through some steps for what you can do from taking your district-level work around your policy and your district-level wellness team into the school level for real tangible results. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so as Hannah mentioned, you know, it's, it's important to recognize all the things that are happening at a district level, but translating that to the school building level is, is oftentimes something that's difficult to do, but, but something that's definitely important to ensure that what's happening at the district level is happening at the school building level as well. So we'll talk about a couple of different things, first starting with building a wellness team, and then we'll talk a little bit about creating an action plan to ensure that the district wellness policy is actually being implemented at the school building level. And then we'll, we'll end a little bit later on talking a little bit about some of the tools and resources that Action for Healthy Kids provides for schools so that you can share those resources with the schools and districts that you're working with to, again, ensure that what's happening at the district level can happen at the school building level as well. So let's first talk about a, a well, building a wellness team. And before we dive in, I want to just emphasize that the points that we'll discuss today are relevant whether or not a school has already established a wellness team. You know, as, as schools are building wellness teams, it's important to frequently examine the makeup of the team. And as we all know, you know, schools are always changing. And people leave. People become busy during the year or, or might even lose interest in participating on a wellness team. And additionally, it can be difficult to recruit parent wellness champions at the beginning of the year, but that also can become easier as active parents are identified throughout the school year and relationships with them are built. So 
you know, this is something that, that's important to do regardless of what stage the school is at with regard to building their wellness team. So let's go ahead and we'll jump right in, just giving some general tips for building a wellness team and having successful meetings. So first, especially schools that do not already have a wellness team, schools should find out if there are any wellness-oriented groups that already exist in the school. For example, some schools have a green team that focuses on school garden kinds of initiatives. Um, and that can be a great place to start and a great place to, to join efforts instead of forming a new committee, which sometimes can be a little bit daunting and, and scary for, for the school and for, for people that are um, willing to commit their time. So if these, these groups do exist, schools should find out what they're working on and try and get to know the people on the team. And as I mentioned, if their work is headed in that same direction or if they have a similar focus, then it may make sense to merge the two groups instead of creating a new committee and then at that point perhaps creating subcommittees on that, on that one team is, is a great way to get everyone's goals accomplished. And then if there isn't a wellness, existing wellness group or if the current groups do not mesh well with the goals of the, the school wellness team, then it might be start, time to start a new committee. Next, schools should identify other champions that can help lead the committee. So these, these champions can really build on the energy and the passion and the expertise of the other active contributors. So in general, schools should look for people that are creative, committed, passionate about student health, or even passionate about their own health. You know, the, the folks that are excited about fitness or, or healthy eating, those might be great individuals to pull onto the wellness team to help to translate that personal passion to, to school wellness. And then also finding folks that are great con communicators and are really determined to see challenges through. As I'm sure you all have experienced, there can be a lot of barriers related to implementing school wellness initiatives at the school building level. So um, really finding folks that are excited and committed to working through those barriers is going to help have some success in the future. Additionally, it's, it's important to get the principal's approval and buy-in at the highest possible level of commitment. From the research that's out there and from our experience in the field, we at Action for Healthy Kids know that without the principal's buy-in and support, it can be really difficult to have the longer-term sustained changes that we're really seeking to do in schools. It goes back to that learn, act, transform model that Action for Healthy Kids is, is based upon. That transform component is really difficult to do if schools don't have the approval and commitment from the principal. So at a minimum, the principal really needs to be aware of and give his or her approval for what the school is doing. And if schools can't get their support, meaning that they can't get that, that belief in the importance of the wellness work and the principal won't publicly support it, then you know, it's, it's trying to get whatever sort of commitment from the principal that, that's possible. Um, you know, the most ideal situation, of course, is that the principal becomes active participant on the wellness team. But if that doesn't happen, it's OK, and the school can still um, move forward with whatever support that they do have. And then finally, it's, it's a really good idea to develop an elevator pitch. You know, coming up with a 30-second statement where the wellness team can really talk about what they're doing to create that sense of purpose. And, and that not only allows other individuals to start supporting the wellness team, but it can really create a culture of supporting school wellness in general. So it's really important at the beginning to develop that elevator pitch of, of what is important to the team and what they're trying to accomplish. So in terms of actually develop it, developing a team, of course we want to have school staff, parents, and community members join the team. So there's a couple of ideas that are listed here on the screen of, of different ways to garner that support from the school staff and uh, school community members. One, asking the principal for his or her ideas on staff people who are, might be interested in joining is a great way. The principal typically has a relationship with most individuals in the school building and may be able to identify some individuals that you might not readily think of. Additionally, approaching any staff with whom the wellness coordinator has a good relationship and asking for their suggestions. Um, additionally, anyone who seems like an obvious good fit. You know, I had mentioned individuals who have that personal passion for health, but also people like the school nurse, the health teacher, PE teacher, school lunch personnel. And at the very least, it, it never hurts to ask. And sometimes that personal invitation to join the wellness team can be a, a really great way to, to get people committed right from the get-go. 
Additionally, surveying the parent community is another approach that has been successful with some of the schools that we've worked with. Trying to get a better understanding of how do parents perceive wellness at a school. Oftentimes, having them complete an initial survey starts to garner that initial support and it may be a great way to get parents involved on the wellness team from the start. Additionally, speaking at a staff meeting, a PTO or a PTA meeting, or a SAC meeting is, a, is another great opportunity to spread the word about school wellness, give that elevator speech that was developed when the team was initially getting started, and really to garner additional support for the team. So you'll see there are a couple of other bullets listed here that I won't, I won't go into detail on. But just in general, try to have the team represent the diversity of the school community. You know, this helps ensure that the projects meet the actual needs of the school community instead of maybe what the wellness coordinator, what a couple of individuals perceive the needs to be. And then just in general, make sure you include the key players and, and influencers in the school and include people that can commit the time. I think oftentimes we, we think that people who participate on the school wellness team need to be champions, all of them for wellness, and that's not necessarily the case. Some people are able to, to support the effort and provide something related to their individual skill set that may not be the champions that we're expecting. And that's okay because they are bringing skills and they are certainly contributing in other ways. So those are a couple of just general tips on building a wellness team and developing that team. So here are a couple of just general tips for successful wellness team meetings that I think are important to convey to ensure that those who join the wellness team initially really stay on board and, and keep attending meetings. So first, you know, plan meetings at times that are convenient for the people who are interested in being on the wellness team. And if parents are involved, it might be necessary to consider offering child care or, or even healthy snacks or meals if it's at a time where people are typically eating. In addition to that, try to have meetings at regular times so people can, can work their schedule around it. When in my previous job, I was, I was working in Indiana and Several schools that I worked with actually scheduled the same meeting before and after school, and that ensured that individuals who could come before school were still getting the same information as the individuals who could come after school. And it was a way to make it flexible for the wellness team members. And in addition to that, it kept the meetings short and concise, which propelled the, the school wellness initiatives and really kept people on board for the entire school year. In addition, make sure that there's a welcoming environment at every meeting. Little things like greeting each person or smiling or making eye contact can really go a long way. And sometimes it's, it's even important to provide name tags so that people can address each other by name. All of these things really create this welcoming, warm environment and will get people to continue coming to meetings. Offer opportunities for conversation and interaction. People will feel more invested if they've developed relationships with others. Oftentimes we have so much to accomplish in a meeting that we forget this key element, but it really is important to provide some time for people to get to know each other, whether it's an, an organized icebreaker or it's keeping the conversation informal. It's a great way to have people feel like they really truly belong to the team and belong to the group and that their opinions are important and welcome. Always have a focused agenda. Send it out in advance if possible and follow it. Um, include a start and in time for the meeting and be sure to start and end on time. This is really important for schools as we know they have so many other commitments. If people feel like the meetings are a waste of time, they will stop attending. And this is something that we have seen in some of the schools that, that we're working in, especially here in Chicago, where it's, it's difficult to keep people on board if the meetings are not concise and, and with a purpose. And accomplish as much as possible with emails and phone calls. This is really important for schools. Sometimes it isn't possible to schedule meetings regularly, but emails and phone calls can be a great way to still keep people engaged and involved in the school wellness initiative. And finally, consider forming subcommittees if needed to work on different projects. As I mentioned, you know, people are going to come to the table with different skill sets and interests, and this may be a great way to engage folks on, on a level that's important to them through these subcommittees as opposed to one general wellness committee. So that's, that's one first pass. It's a great tangible way for schools to start implementing at the school building level what's occurring at the district. The second 
tangible tasks is really developing and implementing an action plan. So this is something that at Action for Healthy Kids, we encourage all of our schools to write down what their project goals are and really develop a plan to implement their particular wellness initiative or just in general what the purpose of the school wellness team is. So you'll see that there's this quote on the screen from Nathaniel Braden, and it really is true. A goal without an action plan is a daydream. And this is why creating a plan is so important. As we all know, there are definitely people out there who can accomplish their goals without a written plan, but it's not really recommended when you're working with a team. It's important to get everyone on the same page and to really work toward common goals. So let's first talk about the why, because it is extra work, and oftentimes it can be a tedious process to develop an action plan, and we'll sometimes feel that it's an additional requirement of them. But it really is important, you know, first for that team camaraderie, that process of developing an action plan together will make everyone feel more invested, and will also provide an opportunity for everyone to see what the contributions are from the various team members. Second, it provides an opportunity for group brainstorming. As I mentioned, you know, each member of the team does bring different skills to the table, and the plans will almost certainly be better throughout when everyone creates them together. And this is also where that data that was gathered in the School Health Index can come in handy. How can this information that was collected, whether it's at the district or school level, can, be trans can it be translated into the action plan? Third, it provides clear communication. A plan helps everyone understand the project goals, and, and it helps them think about the why when forming the project goals. Why is the project important? Why is there a need at this school? Who is the audience? Is it students? Is it teachers, families, or everyone? It really helps kind of hash out the specific details that are associated with the project goal. And then finally, an action plan helps create a timeline. It's extremely powerful to have it down on paper. We will accomplish this specific task by this specific date. It helps create that sense of urgency, and it also helps keep everyone going so that the project doesn't stall or even stop. So at Action for Healthy Kids, we recommend that all schools use SMART goals to help them measure and track their progress more effectively. Um, I imagine many of you are probably familiar with SMART goals, but we'll go over it just in brief detail. Um, SMART is an acronym for the steps that you see here on the slide. So we, we recommend that schools use goals that are specific rather than general, and that way they can tell a team exactly what is expected, why it's important, who's involved, and where it's going to happen. In our experience, we found that schools that have these specific goals are much more focused and are able to accomplish a lot more than schools that have vague goals. In addition, these, these goals are measurable. They answer questions like how much, how many, and how will I know when it's accomplished. They're also realistic and attainable to be considered meaningful, they, they can't be out of reach, nor can they be considered to represent performance that is below standard. So it's another opportunity for the team to come together and, and truly figure out what is attainable, what is realistic for our school given our current situation. And SMART goals matter. They're relevant to the school, the community, the students, and the students' performance. So it's really important at the school building level to create goals that are relevant for that particular building. And then finally, the SMART goals are time-bound, so they have that target date. And a commitment to the deadline helps the team focus their efforts and prevents goals from being overtaken by the day-to-day -day crises that invariably arise in an organization. As we all know, schools have a lot of other priorities. So they answer questions like when and what specific changes will have occurred by the end of the school year. As I mentioned previously, this really helps schools have that sense of urgency so that they can attain all of these tasks that they set forth in their action plan. So after school wellness teams have, have defined their SMART goals, the next step is to form the implementation plan. So schools should develop a timeline and they should assign tasks. So even things like writing out action steps or sub-steps, the team member responsible, the start and the end dates, and the status or to-do list for each task can be extremely helpful. The team should include things like evaluation, project promotion, and communication in this component as well. These are all incredibly important action steps. And you know, it, it can be tedious to figure out who does what and when, but in the end, it really is going to support the school to make sure that they know what they need to do to get to each goal and, and have a plan for getting there. 
And then also teams will need to develop a budget. They should write down all of the potential costs of a project, which could include equipment and supplies, incentives, awards, promotion, printing and copying. And some of these items may be able to be donated or borrowed, so that it provides another opportunity to, before starting the project, take a look at what can be borrowed or donated or requested from the local school community, and what do we actually need to spend our funds on. So to help schools develop and implement an action plan, Action for Healthy Kids has developed a wellness project action plan template and budget, which is posted on our website. And this is something we will also share in a follow-up email. Essentially, it's a plan that it's an award document that schools can actually go in. And everything that we've talked about in the past couple of slides, they can use that template to input that information. Um, it, it can be, as I mentioned, kind of a long a process for schools. But what we have found is schools that have used this template and, and similar templates have been incredibly successful in their initiatives. And they've referred back to that action plan every time they get together to make sure that they're on track. So after the action plan is completed, of course, it's time to implement the plan, to put it into action. And as I mentioned, schools should follow that action plan. They should continually reassess and they should continually track their progress against their project goals. Part of this includes reflecting upon the successes and the challenges. And we always try to encourage schools to make note of those successes and challenges in their action plan, keep it more as a working document. And that way in the future, if the makeup of the wellness team does change, all of that information is recorded and can be used in future years. And it's important to celebrate and communicate those successes throughout the course of the project, not only to reinforce the key messages and recognize achievement, but also to thank participants, which in turn will help build future support. There's a couple of ways that schools can do this, but oftentimes giving updates to the PTO, PTA, or, or other committees is a great way to do it, or including successes in school communica communication avenues, such as the daily announcements or the school newsletter, handouts that go home to parents, um, or even on the school marquee. All of these existing communication methods are great ways to celebrate school wellness uh, because people are already used to viewing those avenues for school, for school messages. So in general, schools should really utilize whatever way they typically communicate to highlight success. And people will be more likely to want to be involved next time if they feel like their work is truly appreciated. So let's talk a little bit about school wellness sustainability. And I'm going to briefly cover this due to um, we want to leave some time for questions at the end. But um, let's just quickly take a look at this quote from one of our Action for Healthy Kids team members in Texas. A project has more chance for sustainability if it results in a lifestyle change supported by the school environment and family. And so this is really a good definition of sustainability when it comes to health and wellness projects. We're trying to create lasting lifestyle changes, not those one-time projects that might have a short-term value that don't have a lasting impact. So we really want schools after the funding ends for We Choose Health to be able to really make sure that their impact is lasting. A couple of things that, that are important to that is one, community engagement. Getting that school staff, the parents, the students, and the community members involved in the planning and the implementation is a great way to get their buy-in and, and ensure that their support is lasting and positive. That principal buy-in is, is so critical as well, and that's something that we've discussed previously. But that has been something that in the schools that we've worked with across the country, we've noticed that principal buy-in is key to having a sustainable impact. Additionally, making the project an ongoing initiative is definitely going to contribute to its chance for sustainability. So in the way that it's presented should be as an ongoing program as opposed to a one-time event or even as a school year long project. And if possible, schools should try and get it written into the district or the school level wellness policy, as Hannah mentioned earlier, or even the school handbook or the school improvement plan. Whatever can be done to ensure that the work that's, that's done one school year continues on to the next. And then one final note about sustainability. I, I'm sure you all are familiar with the Healthier U.S. Schools Challenge, and I know that you're working to, to plan a webinar in the future for it. But just to, um, to provide a little bit of information about it, you know, it is a certification program that helps recognize schools that have created healthier school environments. 
and this is important for sustainability, not only because there's a financial incentive for schools that are awarded, but also just that recognition, it's that positive publicity that Hannah was talking about earlier that can garner that additional support for future years. So I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to talk about some of Action for Healthy Kids' resources and programs that you can use with the districts and schools that you're working with. And I'll go over this very briefly, but um, everything, all of the links will be included in the follow-up email so you can explore it on your own. So first, the Learning Connection is a great resource that can help um, make the connection between physical activity, healthy eating, and learning. It's essentially an easy-to-read report that we published earlier this year that summarizes the most recent research proving that healthy kids are better learners. So this is a great tool to use to get that additional support from school building administrators, district level administrators, part of that learn, that educational component on why healthy kids are better learners. Additionally, we offer a variety of school wellness programs. These are all free online on our website. Game On, which you see at the top, is the program we use with elementary school students. And it's a five-step program that schools can use that guide them from forming a wellness team, conducting a needs assessment, creating that action plan we talked about earlier, and then choosing what specific wellness initiatives they want to implement. So the Game, the game On program is made up of Eat Better and Move More, initiative, uh, move more Challenges, so schools have the flexibility to pick what works for them. Fuel Up to Play 60 is the program, it's similar to Game On, but it's something that we use for middle schools. And then finally, the Students Taking Charge program is our high school wellness framework that is designed as a leadership program to engage high school students in planning physical activity and nutrition initiatives. So all of these are available on our website. It does require you register just so we can track how many people are using the programs, but we will definitely send these links in a follow-up email. In addition to our school programs, we do have a parent leadership series, and the, the various chapters essentially are highlighted here on your screen, but this program is, is for parents and community members as we, we feel that they have a crucial role in creating healthy school communities. So we've developed this series, and it's essentially it's a series of webinars that are presented live throughout the year and are also archived, so you can certainly view them later on. And those resources that we mailed to you a few weeks ago include many of the handouts that are associated with the Parent Leadership Series. So these are, it's called the Parent Leadership Series, but it's definitely relevant information for schools or community members as well. And then part of this series is our Share Healthy Food and Physical Activity Program at School. Uh, it's a presentation on our website that you can download and share with parents, community members, and others that are interested in school wellness. And the presentation really strives to increase awareness of the need to share food and physical activity in school. So um, again, this will be shared in a, in a follow-up email, but we definitely encourage you to check out this presentation and use it as a tool when you're educating others on the importance of school wellness. So I know we have just uh, about five minutes left, so at this time I'll, I'll turn it back over to Hannah and she'll take some questions and wrap up. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I know that we, all, we mailed you, each of you um, that are focusing on coordinated school health, a, um, a packet in the mail of, of resources, including some of our handouts from the Parent Leadership Series and the Learning Connection Report, a copy of that as well, um, so that you have some of our resources in printed version. But they are all available on our website, and they're fantastic resources, including this presentation that Heidi was just talking about, the Share Healthy Foods and Activities at Schools presentation. Um, it's a great short presentation that you can do in about 30 minutes to you know, principals, to school board members, to anybody in the field that you want to talk to about why healthy schools are important, and it's a really fantastic resource that has notes and, and a full PowerPoint. So that includes um, data. I know there's a comment um, in the question box about importance of including data on school health and, and issues, and there are some, um, some, some, some great data in that presentation that you can use and, and that why it's important and why we need to make uh, childhood obesity and school wellness a priority. Um, and then in addition, some of the resources in the parent leadership series that were mailed to you have some additional information and really information that you can use to talk to your school leaders about why making health a priority is important in their district. I wanted to just um, address one more question. I had somebody comment about that they were 
um, a hospital employee that is working with five school districts in their county. And in my previous position, I would, had pretty much the same role. I worked for a community health department at a local hospital, and I was running the coordinated school health initiatives in two large districts in, in my county. And it can be really challenging as an outsider um, to make yourself relevant in a school district um, and kind of advocate for these things if, if you're not a school staff person. But I would encourage you to keep keep up the good fight and uh, continue to try to build those relationships and keep yourself in front of um, you know, school administration and, and the issues on the table and find someone in each district that can be kind of an inside advocate for you um, because it does help make yourself relevant if you can just show that you're concerned and you're around and you're engaged um, and that people on, on the school side are rooting for this as well which is why it's really important to work on that wellness policy. It's a good starting point. Um, and then work with that district wellness council as well as school-level wellness councils and around school-level action plans just to keep the conversation going at multiple levels so you can keep yourself relevant. So the two questions that we had really were about data and about you know being from an outside perspective. Um, and I would encourage you, if you have more questions about that, to email Heidi and I. Our emails will be included in the follow-up email. Um, and, and we're really happy to help in any way that we can um, to help you in your community. We both have expertise in working at the community level, um, as well as uh, content-specific expertise around school wellness. So we're happy to um, be a resource for you as you work on your coordinated school health initiatives with your funded community. So finally, I wanted um, to wrap up today just by talking about the Every Kid Healthy Pledge. If you want to learn more about Action for Healthy Kids and how you can get involved in our mission and our movement, we encourage you to take the Every Kid Healthy Pledge, which is helping us to create a 100,000-person movement all across the country of people who believe that every child deserves to be healthy and that all schools can be healthier places. It just takes 10 seconds to sign up. You can do so very easily on our website. And once you've signed on, we'll show you ways, both big and small, that you can turn your commitment and your belief that every child deserves to be healthy into action. In addition, you'll get resources from um, the Illinois Action for Healthy Kids team and Heidi, which include information on statewide initiatives that we do, including um, the School Health Conference that is the statewide uh, conference around healthy schools that will help happen on April 30th of this year. And we hope that some of the uh, We Choose Health grantees are able to attend. It's, again, April 30th. It's going to be held in Champaign. Um, so we're really excited about that. And if you have questions around that as well, please feel free to email us. Like I said, uh, we're going to send follow-up information to Tracy so you can send it out to the whole group. And we really appreciate your time today. I wanted to uh, also let you know to please mark your calendars for the 2014 We Choose Health calls uh, that have been planned in March, June, and September. So make sure you put it on your calendar now before you get too busy. Really want to thank you all for your time and uh, your attention today. Like I said, please feel free to contact us if you have additional questions. And have a great day. Thank you.